The time has finally come to talk about it, the fascinating land of ancient Egypt. I am being joined today by the Medicus Collection, a marvelously curated collection of ancient coins. Its owner was kind enough to film me a group of coins he thought would give you people a nice little comprehensive tour of some of the best coins Egypt could offer. So what more can I say? Let's delve a bit into the early history of Egyptian coinage some of its basic details and how it worked, and see some beautiful coins in this two episode special. Let's go! Egypt in numismatic terms is, in my eyes, a bit of an anomaly. The land of the pharaohs was around for many thousands of years, had a strong economy, a very robust trade connection with Africa, Asia and Europe. However, coinage only seems to have appeared during the very last dynasty. Pharaohs Teos and especially Nectanebo II are credited with the issuing of the very first native Egyptian coins, used mainly as a means of payment for foreign Greek mercenaries. We could later claim that, for a short time, the second coinage system to be used was the one under the Achaemenids, the Persians, who conquered Egypt and toppled the last native pharaohs. But it was with the Greeks, with Alexander the Great and his conquest of Egypt, that coinage would finally be introduced en masse and start making part of the history of the region. Alexander used this system based on the original Attic standard, established in Athens, which used silver drachma and tetra drachma as the main coins in silver, gold staters as valuable storages of wealth, and smaller base metal coins to allow for minor everyday commerce to flow. However, the ones who really issued the first series of coins in Egypt and transformed it into a fully monetized society were the Ptolemies, established by one of Alexander's successors, Ptolemy I, who took Egypt after Alexander's death. For nearly 300 years, the Ptolemaic monarchs would issue coins, and today we're going to focus particularly on their coinage. The Ptolemies did things a bit differently to what Alexander first stipulated. Egypt was a region poor in silver, rich in gold and base metals such as copper. Its gold to silver ratio then was different from the rest of the Hellenistic world. And seeking to keep a tighter grip on its economy, Ptolemy reformed the monetary system and restricted Egypt's territory monetarily as well. No foreign coins could enter, they had to be exchanged at the border, and no Ptolemaic coins could leave the country, it had to be exchanged again. This was a major source of silver to the imperial coffers, because every time this transaction, this trade happened, a little bit of a percentage would go to the imperial coffers. In very broad strokes, that's how the system worked. The drachma, originally a silver coin, became a big bronze piece, and the fractions of a drachma, obols, were also bronze coins. Six obols made a drachma. There was even an octobo or an eight obo coin, so more than a full drachma. The much scarcer silver was saved for most important denominations. Although there are rare varieties to these, in broad strokes the main silver coins were a four drachma and the ten drachma pieces, the tetra drachma and the deca drachma. Gold also played a big role, with some of the most impressive gold coins of the ancient world being minted in Egypt, in particular the Nayeon and the Half Nayeon, worth 150 drachma respectively. So as we jump in and we start our little tour, let's begin with the man who started it all, the very own Ptolemy I. There are some controversies on who was the first living man to put his portrait on a coin, and Ptolemy is one of such candidates. So far up to this time in history, there was a consensus that money was a space reserved for deity. Gods, deified figures, they all had a place on coins, but a living person having the nerve of invading such a spot, coinage, was a bit of a taboo, which leads to this piece. This is a teta drachma, so a four drachma coin, struck at the very same capital of the new Greek Egypt, Alexandria, 
at 294 BC. Ptolemy had some very unique facial features that made him easily distinguishable. A very prominent brow ridge, an equally projected shin, and the portraiture of his coins often captured these nuances very well. The obverse in this piece shows nothing but a bust of Ptolemy, looking to the right. We see him wearing a headband, the symbol used by the Greeks to symbolize kings and royalty, and his wild and somewhat unkept flocks of hair almost give him a wild-looking expression. The reverse has this lovely eagle. Get ready to see a lot of eagles in Ptolemaic coinage. This was a very deliberate move by the Ptolemies. You see, instead of enacting a policy of oppression over the local populations by trying to impose their own Greek pantheon over the traditional Egyptian deities, a more friendly approach was used to form bridges between the Greek newcomers and the natives. The eagle was the old symbol of Zeus, the king of the gods, and as a result, a symbol deeply connected to power, to the whole concept of rulership and command. But as we know, Egyptians also used a diverse variety of birds in representing some of their pantheon. Ex examples like the gods Horus, Thoth, Nekbet, among others, come to mind. So the eagle was, was found as a middle ground. It was used as a bridge between the symbolisms of two different worlds affording the locals some level of similarity with the newcomers and their own new pantheon. Once we head to the legends, the legends go straight to the point. Ptolemaios Basileo, or of King Ptolemy. These tetradrachma are also slightly lighter compared to the rest of the Greek world, weighing just under 15 grams instead of the 17 grams of other kingdoms. And for our next coin, we head over to his son, Ptolemy II. His rule is one of the, the most fascinating ones of the whole history of Ptolemaic Egypt, as so much happened during his long 38-year-long rule. The Library of Alexandria was built under him. An explosion of innovation and artistic de development sued. The Lighthouse of Alexandria was also built under him. Commerce prospered, the country, was strong. It, it, the country was strong, it really was a golden age for Egypt. Also, during his reign, a strong amalgamation between native Egyptian iconography and Greek tradition happened. The king was commonly depicted in old Egyptian style. Hieroglyphic writings from this period referring to him are as common as Greek ones. All in all, we can say he was a pretty competent ruler. So let's take a look at some of his coins. So for our first example, this is a tetadrachma, struck around the year 260. Curiously, this piece was struck at Tarsos, all the way across the sea in Asia Minor, where they held territories at that time. Style-wise, the coin is very similar to the tetadrachma struck by his father. The old and tired bust of Ptolemy I gives way to the younger bust of Ptolemy II with their characteristic wild-looking hair and the imperial headband. The reverse also shows the same formula of the previous coin. We can read Ptolemaio Suthros, from Ptolemy the Great, and the eagle is seen at the middle. What fascinates me the most in this coin is actually in the details. Greek coins introduced something we consider common today, which are mint marks, but instead of letters or numbers, it was common to use small symbols or monograms to identify an issuing city. And in this case, it's a tiny oval shield. How about we take a look at, at a variation? The time of the successor kingdoms was full of wars between these kingdoms. And this second example was one of such cases. This was a coin minted at Cilicia, also in Asian, or Asia Minor. But in this case, this was probably a coin meant to pay for war. The obverse and the reverse are quite similar to the coin we've seen previously. On the obverse, we can see the portrait of Ptolemy II, just like in the previous one. And on the reverse, once again, the eagle. But instead of Ptolemaio Sutros, we have the original Basileu Ptolemaio of King Ptolemy. Now, how about a drachma? Traditionally, the drachma was a silver piece around 3 grams in weight, so a tiny coin. 
The Ptolemy's decision to transform it into a bronze coin meant that it would have to be much, much larger to give it a better impression of value. Here we have one of such drachmas struck, struck under Ptolemy II. It is a very impressive thing. This one in particular is over 50 grams, and it's impressive already, with the very first ones under Ptolemy I going all the way to nearly 80 grams, so it's, it's almost like a modern hockey puck. So on the obverse, we see the image of Amon Zeus, the syncretic mixing between the Egyptian god Amon and the Greek Zeus. The god is shown with a wild, long hair, almost like a lion's mane, and the horns coming out of his head symbolize the Egyptian Amon. On the reverse, just like with the tetadrachma, we have the Ptolemaic eagle. This time, for a control mark, we have a little cornucopia on the left field. The legends, just like the previous time, say Ptolemaio Basileus. And now for the highlight of this episode. This coin is breathtaking. Here we have a deca drachma, so a 10 drachma piece, or two and a half times what you could find on a teta drachma, which in itself is already a very impressive silver piece. And here we have not a king, but a queen. This is Arsinoe II, wife of Ptolemy II, wife and, surprise, surprise, also his sister. This piece was struck between 253 and 246 BC, at the very capital of Alexandria. This is a posthumous coin, and we can see the small details that show her status as a deified figure. On the obverse, we can see this lovely veiled bust, very high relief and full of details, like the clearly distinguishable volume on her hair under the veil. That's the advantage of having such large flans to work on, and of course, such prestigious coin, because this was an important coin, would have the dice produced by the very best engravers the mint had to offer. Also, as we, as we look into the little details, we can see the tip of a ram's horn on her head, just like on the deified image of Zeus, symbolizing her now divine nature. And over her head, the very tip of a lotus scepter, which is supposed to be on her left shoulder, symbolizing her royal titles. We then head to the reverse, where we can see two cornucopias, the horns of abundance. Once again, due to the size of the flan and the prestigious nature of this coin, lots and lots of details are added. We can distinguish individual fruits coming out of the horn, like a pomegranate and some grape clusters. The horns themselves are richly decorated, both being tied together by a royal diadem, the same I've shown previously on Ptolemy's head. This is a very subtle message that the material prosperity of the realm was tightly connected to the fortunes of the royal family. As for the legends, we have a break from the old King Ptolemy formula. Instead, this time, we have Arsinoe Philadelpho, or from Arsinoe, the brother lover. This title, brother lover, was at the same time a show of local pride by the Ptolemies, as they assumed the ancient pharaoh's tradition of intermarriage in the family, while it also had sort of like a negative connotation in the rest of the Greek world, as incest was a major taboo. We finally leave the reign of Ptolemy II behind and take a look at his successor, Ptolemy III, who reigned between 246 and 222 BC. He was also considered the great king of Egypt, which led to his quote-unquote nickname Euergetes, or the benefactor. His reign was a bit overshadowed by his father, yes, he did continue on the successful policies of his father of continuing to integrate Egyptian and Greek peoples, but it's true that many of his wars led to overtaxation of his population, which sprung internal revolts. By that time, you must be noticing there's a clear form formula followed by early Ptolemaic coinage. The current king, or the original Ptolemy I on the obverse, and the ego on the reverse. But let me call your attention to this obverse. It is indeed the bust of Ptolemy III here, but the quality of the portrait, seeking to be as realistic as possible, really impresses me. And it becomes quite clear once I put a picture of a marble bust of Ptolemy III on screen. 
certain key details like the pronounced chin, the wavy hair, the very pronounced brow ridge, the strong jawline are very nicely depicted, showing once again just how important coinage was on the ancient world as a way of spreading someone's image and political agenda. This level of accuracy required good engravers and these were expensive to hire and train. So as we go to the reverse, once again, we are greeted by the Ptolemaic Eagle and the Basileus Ptolemaio legends. But what makes this reverse interesting are the mint marks. These are among multiple mints that were said to be established in Asia Minor, so far away from native Egypt once again, which indicated that this might have been yet another coin minted to pay for war expenses. There's more to come, I promise. The coinage of the Ptolemies is really vast, and just one video just isn't nearly enough to cover it all. So keep tuned for a second episode as we carry on from Ptolemy III onwards. Once again, thank you very much for the Medicus Collection for sharing these amazing pieces with us. And if you liked it, keep tuned for part 2. Leave a like and consider subscribing if you did, it really helps the channel. And I'll see you soon!